Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the bar. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, all you Road to Growth listeners. Uh, I'm lucky today to have Michael Begg, basically e-commerce, 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 and more e-commerce. That's, that's from the podcast. You're going to hear about a story. You're going to hear about ideas. But, Michael, I know it wasn't too much of a question, but kind of tell everyone that's listening right now kind of uh, who you are. Yeah, sure. Vinny, thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, but to give everyone a little bit of background on my story, uh, I'm originally from Connecticut in the U.S. I currently live in Mexico, and there's there's a whole story there we can go over later if we want. But uh, you know, graduated college, started working in the corporate world, had a couple jobs there in consulting, and then real estate development, uh, and ultimately just realized I wanted to do something for myself. So ended up starting to build some e-commerce brands, sell them on the Amazon platform. Uh, ended up exiting those and kind of starting an agency, AMZ Advisors, which is where I run today. And we help other brands and manufacturers sell more on the Amazon platform. All right, so let's let's get into it. Let's go back a little bit to your to your story. Connecticut, mm -hmm. okay. How long were you there for? When did you actually move out of Connecticut? <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I grew up in Connecticut. I spent pretty much my entire life there. I went to college in New York and Philly, um, and uh, left. When, after college, went back to Connecticut, left Connecticut in uh, 2015, right. uh, started traveling a little bit in the U.S., and then 2016, I actually moved outside of the country. So in Connecticut, when you're going to school, or actually when you went to Philly uh, and over there, what was, what was your major? Uh, I studied economics and political science, and it has nothing to do with marketing, <laughs> although I run a marketing firm now. <laughs> So what was that? What was that transition like? So you were focused on getting to politics. What were you focused on when you were going to school? Yeah. So uh, I think what I was always interested in when I was younger was, uh, you know, investment banking and finance. Um, I grew up in the New York area. You know, so many of my friends' parents were in that field. Uh, you know, kind of saw it all around me. So it was something that I looked up to. I thought that was really cool. So that was originally the idea that I was going down. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, it didn't work out. I kind of got into consulting and some other things. So, um, you know, my, I guess the degrees don't matter in a way. They just kind of help me figure out processes and, you know, learn how to do things better. Now, were you, so you were planning to do it, but you said things didn't work out. Was it more of opportunities from up that came about that kind of pushed the other one around or did things not work out in a sense that you tried that way and it didn't go anywhere? Yeah, I think it's just uh, work didn't work out in the way that, you know, my background, my, my education, whatever it was, wasn't a good fit for the finance industry. Uh, a lot of my interests weren't aligned, I guess. And I had a, a tough time getting some, you know, internships that I thought were worthwhile. Um, so I kind of just focused on enjoying what I was doing at the time, uh, you know, during the summer instead of working some, you know, corporate internship, I, I was living on an island island uh working on at a marina so you know at the end of the day i just figured out that i would rather be happy than just you know wasting my summer doing whatever where did that do you remember the moment where you started figuring out you want to be happy no i mean i've talked to a lot of people that it took them a, a long time in life to actually figure out okay i make money this direction yet i'm happy in this direction <laughs> and they kind of push that away and they but do you remember that moment when you started to figure that out uh oh it's tough i don't think it's any one moment i think it's you know it happens over time and there's obviously points where i was moving towards that and other points where i was moving away from it um you know i think i would say it started probably in college when i started realizing that uh you know i was just there to do as good as i could in school you know figure out you know at the time i thought a good job after i graduated so work hard you know i played lacrosse so do well in lacrosse whatever it was um and I just realized that my, my school year was so packed with activities. I was like, I need time to, to unwind. Uh, and that's kind of what I took the summers for. Instead of working a corporate internship, I did internships during the school year while I was playing lacrosse, while I was working part time and you know doing a double major. 
Um, so I really pushed myself during the school year, the summer, I realized I needed time for myself to unwind. Uh, and then, you know, I just thought that I, I, I don't know, I, I guess I had a different, uh, idea when I graduated and realized I need to get a real job and get into the real world. Uh, so I started working at Deloitte and consulting. Um, you know, I, I honestly hated it. <laughs> I really didn't like working in the corporate world. Um, it got a little bit better when I went to Sears and worked in real estate development because I had a little bit more freedom in my schedule. Um, but at the end of the day, I just knew that I needed to be able to make my own schedule, do things for myself. And, you know, it just led me to start my own businesses with uh, my partners. Do you think that that first company that you went to, um, you said Sears, right? Or Deloitte? Deloitte, uh, Deloitte yeah. So for so Deloitte, do you think if they would have gave you more freedom um, underneath them, that you would have be, been happy there? Or is there any way they could have done something to make you happy in that corporate environment? I don't know. Consulting's very tough. Uh, the schedule's a little crazy. You know, you're kind of all over the place. You really don't have a life when you're working in that. Um, so no, I, I don't think there's anything that could have really done. Uh, I mean, you know, it would have been nice to make more money, but like at the end of the day, making money is not the, you know, the, the end all and be all of everything. So that wouldn't have really changed much. Uh, I think I just needed... Uh, you know, more, more time on my schedule and, you know, real estate, as you probably know, real estate development, you're on the road more, you're kind of doing things in your own schedule. You're showing up, you're scheduling meetings when you need to, uh, it's just a lot more freedom. And, you know, that was something I realized that, uh, I enjoyed more when I was working at Sears and it was something that was definitely missing in my first corporate job. Makes sense. I mean, so when you knew that, when do you know that you're going to transition out of the corporate world until starting your own business? Uh, it was kind of like something, like I said, it it felt like something was missing. Like I was happier than I was in my first corporate job because I had more time, but I realized that I still wasn't doing everything for myself because I was still reporting to other people. You know, I had other managers, those other people that I was responsible uh, to answer to. So for me, I just knew that something was still missing there and that, you know, I didn't have that, that total autonomy. And that's kind of what, I started uh, thinking about how to to get that. And, you know, the first thing I thought about was, all right, how can I create you know passive income or make money on the side to help support myself? Uh, and it started with really what the first entrepreneurial entrepreneurial venture was was selling Kindle eBooks on Amazon uh, and just getting a royalty on every book I sold. So you know, I still do that, make some money from it, uh, and then it turned into you know, importing products from Asia and selling those on the Amazon platform. And then it just evolved into an agency where, you know, I had to answer to my clients, but there was, you know, as myself, my two other partners, we were controlling our own schedule. We had our own freedom and that was just like the best thing. What was that process? When you're buying from, from uh, Asia and then mm-hmm. selling on Amazon, did you know what company to go through? Were you going through a corporate world? Are you going directly to the distributor? I mean, or how was that? How was that working out trying to find the, the right system in place? Yeah. So uh, we had to learn a lot. We, we, you know, consumed a lot of different content that was out there and kind of learning how to do this. Uh, we fi- we found out about the Alibaba website pretty early. And then we started using Alibaba to reach out to distributors that were in China uh, for products that we saw good opportunities for in the Amazon space. So we started a couple brands. One was in art supplies. One was in like outdoor goods sporting goods, things like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, you know, you're, you're working directly with these manufacturers in China or their agents or whoever it is uh, to get the product you want, get your branding on it, get the, get everything, you know, made, get it shipped to you. And then it just kind of arrives at your doorstep and you're like, all right, now, like I just have to sell it. Uh, and that's what Amazon is great for. It's easy to sell it. If, you don't have, you know, you don't need to be a huge brand. Any any individual seller can get on there and start making money. How much overhead do you remember? How much do you have to with to much capital? Um, the first inventory purchase we made was, I think, about four hundred units. Uh, I think we ended up paying like you know two thousand two thousand dollars for the units, and maybe like another three or four hundred dollars for shipping and customs and things like that. So, I mean, you know, we started a brand with $2,400, uh, you know, $100 to create a logo. Um, and yeah, we pretty much had our brand. We had our products that 
uh, were ready to sell. They arrived at our, our doorstep. We shipped them into Amazon, which has a little cost, you know, to get your inventory there. And then once it's there, Amazon just takes fees when you sell a product. So, um, you know, it's the overhead to get started. You really don't need that much money. Uh, I think, you know, $5,000 tops is pretty much all you really need to, to start being successful on Amazon. Was it successful? Your product sold? How was that? Yeah. So uh, the first day we actually launched was in uh, December. And just to, to you know, give you an idea of what successful is, uh, you know, we, we learned how to do everything right, how to make our listings look good, how to make them show up well on the Amazon platform. And the first day that our product went live, we sold 30 units. Uh, and we were ecstatic because, you know, that was almost 10% of our inventory uh, in one day. And, you know, we at that point, we just realized that we were onto something. Um, so it just kept going from there. I mean, we got to the point where one brand was doing about uh, $45,000 a month in sales. The other brand was doing about 15,000 a month in sales. And, you know, we were like, all right, we're, you know, we're a bunch of, we're three guys or four guys. There's another partner then uh, that kind of figured this out on their own. And like, we can help other people do this. And that's where the idea for our agency came from. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it's just fun. It, you think it's so much harder to build a brand or so much harder to sell physical products, but you know, if you understand how the process works or you have the right resources to help you understand how the process works, it's pretty easy to be successful. How did you, um, or why did you transition doing it yourself compared to teach people how to do it? <laughs> we, uh, just wanted something that was probably more consistent is what I would say. Um, the great thing about selling is like, you know, you have your products coming in, you're, you're continually selling them. But in reality, once you have your brand that it doesn't take as much time to run, it's kind of a part-time thing. Um, uh, you know, we needed, we needed something to do. <laughs> That's really what it came down to. So, you know, we needed a normal work schedule, uh, and we saw a big opportunity for providing these services to other people and teaching other people how to sell on Amazon because we were selling our products. And like I said, it was an art brand. We were competing with companies like Crayola and we were selling way more than Crayola in some categories. And you know, that doesn't make sense. Like how do four guys starting a brand uh, sell more than a massive, you know, multinational company. Uh, and that's kind of where we realized there was a demand for the services and that we could help other people do better as well. So not only, you know, were we selling our own products and doing well, we had an opportunity to, help others and you know help them succeed or achieve their dreams or their goals, whatever it was for the Amazon platform. And then, yeah, it just allowed us to, to build a you know, multi-million dollar agency over the course of five years. And, and how were you finding your clients when it first, when you first started going, became like an consultant company, how did you find your clients? So we started as uh, pretty much freelancers. Uh, we started working on like the Upwork platform. Uh, I think Fiverr, freelancer.com. There's another one. There's another platform that Upwork bought, but I can't remember the name now. Uh, Ode Odesk, I think it was. Um, we were just putting ourselves out there, you know, getting on all the platforms. Whenever we saw a job pop up, we were applying to it, trying to do whatever we could to just start getting money in the door. Um, that was the first way that we started getting clients. Then we had a lot of other marketing agencies that had clients that were looking for Amazon help reaching out to us on these platforms because they didn't know what they were doing. Uh, so it was a good way for us to start building, you know, better relationships with bigger brands, which allowed us to, you know, continue to go out and get more clients and show them, you know, the body of work we have or the brands that we've served. Um, and yeah, from there, it just kind of was, was a snowball effect in a way. We kept doing marketing on the content marketing side with SEO, uh, video marketing, any way we could get our message and our name out there. And yeah, it just keeps going and going, uh, keeps going and going. I mean, at this point we do 30,000 users to our month, uh, to our website a month. Uh, and you know, we don't do any outbound market, any outbound sales. Everything is just inbound leads now. Wow. Is So was there a point do you guys still sell any products through Amazon or is it mostly a uh, consulting work now? Uh, yeah, we still sell products through Amazon. So we have, okay, yeah. uh, we have a partnership with a couple other uh, brands that are launching this, uh, I think next month actually in March. Um, and then we also have a few brands that we're starting ourselves. And, and then I help, 
you know, my girlfriend has a couple of brands that I'm helping her build and her, helping her to start selling online. So uh, definitely still selling. It's just a huge part of it. I mean, there's such a big opportunity. It doesn't make sense. It makes so much sense to just keep doing it. Look, all team compared to the selling is, is kind of the companies like 50, 50, 60, 40. Do you? Yeah, it's about, uh, it's about 50, 50 right now. Um, I okay. mean, the great thing is we've been able to build out a pretty large team. We have, you know, 30 people at this point. So the majority of the consulting work is being handled by a lot of our team. Uh, and then we're, you know, we're just kind of selling stuff on the side. So, uh, combined, I mean, they both are allowing us to grow a lot faster than we planned. Uh, and it's just keeping us busy on, on both sides, uh, you know, learning how to sell better and figuring out the best, uh, opportunities to grow on the Amazon platform as things continue to change and get more competitive. And then provide that advice to our clients and to you know our team, so they can let their clients know what to do. I mean, any uh, entrepreneur, any business owner knows not everything is kind of shiny objects and everything's fantastic. Was there any kind of like hurdles, struggles, things that you kind of had to work through um, or working through uh, throughout the process? Yeah, so uh, I think there's definitely a few hurdles that we've learned. Uh, you know, the first one was like I mentioned, you know, we had these brands, we started as a uh, four person uh, team. We ended up losing one of our team partners. Uh, just, it wasn't really a good fit. So, you know, they were, he was one of our friends too, which made it more difficult. So, you know, starting a business with friends is sometimes hard, especially if not everyone's as motivated uh, to get things, you know, going and being successful. So that was one thing we definitely learned. Um, you know, another one is, being smart uh, with what we're doing when we're trying to launch brands. You know, we saw a lot of opportunities that we thought were phenomenal, like umbrellas, for example. Uh, you know, umbrellas were selling millions of dollars a month on Amazon, but the price point was so low and we couldn't get the manufacturing cheap enough for it to really be profitable for us. So we ended up, you know, breaking even or probably losing money on like a couple thousand umbrellas that we bought. So, you know, that's obviously another big le uh, learning lesson. Um, and then, you know, just running an agency, that's a whole different beast. So now like I'm responsible for my clients' results, but I'm also responsible for my employees, their well-being, making sure they're well, uh, you know, they're taken care of. So if we're messing up with clients or we're losing clients, that obviously has an effect on them and the entire business. So, you know, getting into the agency space has really opened my eyes to a lot more really running a business versus just kind of selling a brand or a product for yourself. Well, back to having to to let go your other buddy, other partner. How was the conversation? Was it you and two guys talking over saying, hey, this is not really working out? Or what was that conversation like? Uh, we probably didn't handle it the best way, but uh, we were just kind of honest with them. I mean, we were actually roommates as well. So uh, okay. myself and one of my other business partners with him. So it was really just a tough situation. Uh, you know, it got to the point where we just had different goals. Like, you know, our goals were to, you know, quit our full-time jobs or our corporate jobs and just do this full-time. Uh, you know, his was just to make money on the side. And, you know, by doing that, he wasn't focusing full-time on it. So we kind of just told him like, yeah, this isn't working. We're going to go do this. And, you know, like we, we, you had, it was a tough conversation. It was like, you had a chance to like show that you're interested in this and put your time and effort into it. And you're just really not as invested as we are. And yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the way it went. Um, luckily we were already out of our first brands, um, that we were selling online at that point. So, you know, we didn't have to worry as much about those businesses going, but it was really about the agency going forward. And we wanted to make sure that all of us were really invested in growing the business. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how that conversation went. If, if you could, I haven't talked to him since. So. If you go back or someone's listening right now and they're thinking about starting a business with friends, what kind of advice would you give to your maybe younger self or to them? What kind of questions would you ask? Things like that. Yeah, I think the number one thing that would make sense to ask or, or, or to discuss with your partners is talk about your goals and where you want to be in you know, five years or 10 years or whatever it may be. Uh, I think if you don't have the same goal alignment in the long term, there's always going to be disagreements or, or people are going to you know, splinter off from the group or want to do their own thing. And, you know, that's just going to create issues. Uh, I think that's one thing. And then setting the rules early on in the business on how you're going to run things. 
is another thing that's really important. So, you know, if you're going to talk about, you know, paying, pay, pay is a big one. So like, what are we going to pay ourselves? Well, like set the rules. We're going to pay ourselves this amount per month based on whatever the profit is. Um, and like, that's it. There's no discussion on this again, like set the rules early and ahead of time. You're not going to be able to predict everything, but as long as you have at least a good understanding between each other on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, there's going to be a lot less issues you're going to run into down the road. And even if, you know, even if you do run into issues, it, we, uh, they're your friends and like you should, I mean, you know, I'm in business with two of my friends. We call each other on our crap all the time. If like we're doing something that doesn't make sense. So I think that's, that's extremely important uh, to be able to do that with the people that you're trying to start a business with as well. So, I mean, if this is a friend that you kind of know and like you don't feel comfortable calling him out on whatever he's doing wrong, uh, then it's probably not a good person to have in as a business partner. Yeah, you're getting more involved with the person. I can only imagine being co-founders, being roommates, and being friends <laughs> all together. That's a lot of time together. Yes, it was. It was. A, it was a lot of time, and I mean, it was good uh, while we were building. You know, now we don't. Now myself and the other co-founders were more spread out, although we're all uh, spent some time in Connecticut. But um, I mean, it's just part of the process. Like. If you can't be around someone that much and not take things personally uh, and just be honest and open about things, then yeah, it's probably not going to be a good fit when you're starting a partnership. Well, well talking about um, being spread out. So you're in Mexico now, right? Yes, I am. Okay. What brought you to Mexico? What moved you down there? So uh, when we were starting the agency or, or going after it full time, we kind of wanted to change from Connecticut. Uh, we, you know, we all hated the cold weather. We all hated being miserable during the winter. Uh, so we came down to Mexico and we went to like the Cancun area and Playa del Carmen. Uh, we lived there for a while. And then after that, uh, we kind of split up. I went and traveled a little bit more on my own. They went and traveled some more. Uh, and then I ended up meeting my girlfriend who's from Guadalajara and, you know, I live in Guadalajara now. So, um, that's kind of how I ended up here. And then as the business kept growing, we needed to you know, start building teams and then we just hired all of our employees uh, in Mexico. And I'm in our office, even though it's completely empty right now because of COVID. <laughs> so do are they still live in the United States then, your partners? They go back and forth uh, between the US and Mexico. Uh, so right yeah. now one's in Connecticut and one is in uh, Mexico City. So they kind yeah. of, they're kind of all over the place. Why, why do you think it was a push down to, to Mexico? I mean, not and not to like India or Asia or something like that. Uh, the big thing was that our client base was primarily uh, in the U.S. and Canada. Okay. So being in the same time zone made communication a lot easier. I mean, there I would have loved to have gone to Bali or some other places. But you know, when it comes to talking to clients, it's not the easiest from you know working at night in Bali while it's U.S. work hours here. So for us, it just made sense. You know, the being at the beach was incredible. The warm weather is awesome. I mean, you know, we all love Mexico, so uh, it works out well for us. Um, but yeah, I think that's kind of how we ended up here and yeah, we just kept growing it since. And, and, and what's next? So you've kind of talked about before that helping now with like hiring process, hiring companies, uh, hiring, correct? Yeah. So, uh, now we're working on a few different things. I mean, we're continuing to grow the brands that we're starting. We're continuing to grow the agency, but, uh, now I'm also kind of focused a lot more on trying to help other companies, uh, to build a business in Mexico because, there's a lot of opportunities here for entrepreneurs in the U S to grow their business a lot quicker by having a team that's, you know, remote in Mexico. So for example, we have uh, a sales team, we have a customer service team, we have a marketing team here uh, and they all work with us directly. So as you know, I kind of handle marketing. So on the marketing side, by having this team, I put out way more content. I'm way more productive and I'm doing such a bigger marketing effort because I have, this team in Mexico and having this team in the U S would have cost me probably three or four times what it's cost me in Mexico. So, um, that's one of the great advantages. I mean, the same goes for our, our you know, client service and things like that. And I think any entrepreneur can really take advantage of that when they're trying to build a business is that if you don't have the capital to invest or you're bootstrapping it yourself, but you need the help to keep growing, you know, by hiring in another country that is in the same time zone that you can talk to in live time, you know, this I'm on central time here, so I can talk to the entire U S throughout my entire work day. And so can our, the rest of our team. So it just really works out. Uh, it really aligns with what we were trying to do with our business. And I 
believe it can also help a lot of other businesses to grow a lot faster. Would they source the activity to you and then you oversee the activity for the, for that company or how would that process work? Yeah, so the way it works is that essentially uh, the company here in Mexico will do all the recruiting for you. They'll find you the resumes you're looking for, the people you're looking for. You'll, you will give the final approval on it, for example, if you're gonna hire somebody. And then that company in Mexico will go ahead and employ that person. And then that's your employee. So, you know, you can get, we use Slack to communicate, but there's a variety of different communication tools you could use. You could use Skype, you could use WhatsApp, uh, you could use Facebook Messenger if you wanted. But, you know, in live time, this person's working with you one on one. So if you have a process you want to build out uh, or you need, you know, a content manager or a digital marketing expert doing paid ads for you, this person's working with you one on one throughout the day. So if there's something you need, you have a problem, you have a question, you can answer them and they're they're able to answer you right back. And the great thing is from a business perspective is that you don't have to ever open a business in Mexico. You don't have any, you know, tax or legal liabilities here in Mexico, but you also don't have any in the US because you're paying another company to employ this person for you. So when it comes to scaling a business, this is really good for hiring a lot of employees quickly. I mean, like I said, we're up to 30 now um, and that's over two years. So, uh, you know, if you're looking to build a team, there's there's really not much better than doing this. And what is someone right now and they want to hear more about that opportunity, other opportunities you have in e-commerce, what's the best platform for them now or going to? Yeah. So, if you want to learn, you know, I'm always glad to answer questions that anyone has on these type, type of topics. Uh, so you can always reach, reach me directly in my email, which is mike at amzadvisors.com. If you're looking for more help on the e-commerce side, visiting uh, my business's website, amzadvisors.com is where you can learn a lot more about the different ways that we help brands succeed in the e-commerce platforms. And if you're looking to learn more about building a remote team or hiring in Mexico, uh, the place to go there is weexpand.com. It's W-E-X-P-N-D.com. Uh, and yeah, our team there can help you, you know, learn more about the process, see if it's a good fit for you and see if there's any way for us to work together. Perfect. One last question. If, where do you commerce going in the next five, 10, 15 years? <laughs> I certainly don't see it going away. Um, no, I think it's only going to continue to grow. Uh, I think it's become more and more important. I think convenience is one thing that a lot more people are realizing uh, over the past year of being able to be from home, being able to shop and still get your products in a faster time. So I think uh, delivery is going to continue to improve across e-commerce platforms. So Walmart will probably have faster delivery times as well. Uh, we'll target and some other big retailers like that. Um, so convenience will continue to become more important shipping times, getting there faster, uh, product selection is going to be growing a lot more as well. So pretty much every re retailer needs to be online they, they can't afford not to at this point. So making sure your products are there so your customers can find it is extremely important. So more product selection is going to end up benefiting the end consumer. It's going to get them, uh, used to buying online more. So, I, I mean, I think e-commerce is just going to keep growing in the next five to 10 years. Thank you, Mike, for, for being on the podcast. Thanks. Think hopefully everyone listening got some great information about e-commerce. And I mean, you make it sound so simple. I know, I know it, it wasn't <laughs> probably understanding, reading the books, a lot of knowledge right there over time. But I mean, if you're looking to grow your online presence with e-commerce, selling products, things like that, reach out to, to Mike and he'll inside or reach out to his company. Or I mean, by the time you listen to this, he might have three or four or five more companies. So just keep on the lookout of what, what he's offering. Uh, but thank you again, Mike, for being on the podcast. Vinny, thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. And, you know, I, I know I make it sound easy. It, it is pretty <laughs> easy. Don't worry about it. Like, you just have to get in there and start doing it, and you'll figure it all out yourself. So thank you. Well, everyone listening, please subscribe, please share, and of course, tell your friends.